you stole Jessie's life and future. You had power and dominion over her body for a few minutes, but never for one second did you have one ounce of power or control over her spirit, her heart, her will, her grace, her beautiful goodness, and her deep love. These were the last words that Jessie's father said to her killer, who took advantage of their friendship and gruesomely raped and killed her the night after her standout dream performance. So what pushed him to commit this crime against his once lover? Hello, and welcome to another video. As always, we would appreciate it if you would give this video a like, subscribe, and ensure that the notification bell is turned on for more in-depth real crime sagas like this. Without further ado, let's get started. Jesse Blodgett, despite being only 19 years old, was already an exceptionally skilled stage actor and superb pianist. She always wanted to be a performer, so she started singing in the school chorus at an early age and took as many theater classes as she could. Jessie received a full tuition scholarship to study music education at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee after graduating from high school. After finishing high school, Jessie helped support her parents, Buck and Deborah, by working part-time as a waitress and starting her own business in Hartford, Wisconsin, teaching children the piano, violin, and voice. Jessie played the title role in the world-famous musical Fiddler on the Roof on Sunday, July 14th. The theater was jammed with people because the show had sold out. As a follow-up, Jessie went to a celebration with the rest of the cast. At 1 a.m., Jessie got back to her mother's house and passionately reported on the success of the event before saying goodnight and turning in for the night. A pupil scheduled for a piano lesson arrived at the house at 12.30 p.m. the next day. Deborah tried calling her daughter several times, but received no answer. Eventually, she climbed the stairs to Jessie's room in a huff of frustration. When Deborah went up to check on her daughter, she saw Jessie face down on the bed, fully blue and cold to the touch. Deborah immediately started yelling and called 911. The police would find ligature marks all over Jessie's body, including her neck, wrists, and ankles. Her pants and hair were damp, indicating that her attacker made every effort to remove their fingerprints from her body. There were no obvious traces of a break-in, and at first sight, it appeared that whoever had murdered Jesse had cleaned up after himself. They continued searching Jesse's room and discovered a roll of tape hidden under her bed. They thought that her murderer may have dropped it accidentally while running away. Only three days before Jesse's murder, Melissa Etzler was walking her dog in Richfield Historic Park when she grew terrified by the sound of footsteps following closely behind her. The sound of the footsteps continued and grew louder and more rapid. The unidentified attacker pounced on Melissa when she turned around for a second time, this time with a knife in hand, and pinned her to the ground. Melissa was in the midst of a life or death struggle and found herself pinned beneath her assailant. Melissa, thankfully, managed to disarm the attacker and get the knife from his hand. Melissa sustained six cuts to her right hand, which needed 15 stitches to close the wounds. Melissa was fortunate enough to offer authorities a thorough description of her assailant. Richfield police distributed a composite sketch and vehicle description of Melissa's attacker to the media, and a few days later, they got a tip from one of their own. A Richfield deputy told the investigators working on Melissa's case that he had seen the identical blue Dodge Caravan that the attacker had used a month earlier in the same park and had even run the license plate for some reason. The blue Dodge was registered to the parents of 19-year-old Daniel Bartelt. Daniel was Jesse Blodgett's ex-boyfriend and childhood friend. Daniel shared Jesse's musical and dramatic skills. At Hartford Union High School, the two became close friends and later a couple before Daniel broke up with her. After graduating high school, 
Daniel enrolled at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, but he dropped out after only one semester. If Daniel didn't plan on returning to school, his parents informed him that he needed to get to work and start paying rent. Soon after, Daniel told his parents he was working as a stock mover in a factory. He would regularly leave the house at 6.30 in the morning and not return until 5 o'clock in the evening. After a brief separation, Daniel and Jesse spent the summer together. Though Daniel was in a committed relationship with someone else, Daniel still had feelings for Jesse. The day before Jesse's death, Daniel and Jesse had worked together on a song, and he even had a little role in Fiddler on the Roof with her. Daniel was known as a witty and compassionate person by those who knew him, yet he hid a dark side from everyone he met, and not even his parents knew. Daniel was at the Blodgett house on July 16th at 5 p.m., attending Jesse's vigil, when he got a call from the Ridgefield cops wanting to question him. Buck and Deborah reassured Daniel that questioning Jesse's close pals was a standard operating practice. Daniel thought he was being called in for an interview about Jesse's death, but it turned out to be about the attack on Melissa three days prior. Around 5.12 p.m., Daniel checked in at the Richfield Police Headquarters. He had just come back from the vigil for his ex-girlfriend, Jesse Blodgett, who had been raped and strangled. Since the medical examiner's report hadn't even finished, this stood out to the detectives. Jesse's rape was kept a secret from everyone, including the police. Richfield detectives continued their investigation into the attack on Melissa and forwarded Daniel's slip of the tongue to Hartford police, who were handling Jesse's case. After Melissa was attacked at Richfield Historic Park on July 12th, Daniel said he was with his girlfriend at the time. When asked about the cuts and scrapes on his arm and thumb, Daniel said it was a result of an accident at work. Daniel didn't know it at the time, but the police had already done their homework and realized he wasn't working. For months, Daniel had lied to his parents about where he was truly spending his time, taking off to various parks in search of his prey while they believed he was at work. Daniel admitted to attacking Melissa but first claimed he had no intention of physically harming her and instead intended to frighten her. After failing to continue his education, Daniel admitted he was scared about his future and stated he wanted to share that fear with another person. Jessie's autopsy was finished on July 17th, determining that her cause of death was strangulation. As Daniel had told the police the day before, she had also been raped. Daniel was questioned by Hartford police about Jesse's murder the very same day. Despite initially telling Richfield police that he'd been to her vigil, he now claimed that he was unaware of her death. When asked about his whereabouts on the morning that Jesse was murdered, Daniel said he told his parents he was going to work and left the house at 6.30 a.m., but he headed to Woodland Union Park instead. In the Woodland Union Park dumpster, Detectives found a mini wheat cereal box. It contained a bloody SpongeBob SquarePants beach towel, along with bloodied paper towels, antiseptic wipes, tape, two climbing ropes, and a handcrafted gag ball. Daniel's sperm was also discovered in Jesse. Jesse and Daniel's DNA was detected on the climbing ropes that matched ligature marks on her neck, wrists, and ankles. Daniel's fingerprints were all over the roll of tape that was discovered under Jesse's bed. It was the same type of tape that had been discovered inside the cereal box in the park where he attacked Melissa, as well as in his parents' garage. Faster than he could spit them, Daniel's lies were exposed, but it was the mountain of forensic evidence that sealed his demise. According to the prosecution's theory, Daniel's motive was to satisfy his sexual cravings, and he targeted Jesse because he knew her and she trusted him. For the death of Jesse Blodgett, Daniel was charged with first degree intentional homicide. He entered a not guilty plea, but the jury reached a verdict of guilty 
after deliberating for barely three hours. Judge Todd Martins criticized Daniel's despicable behavior and called him a self-pitying and self-absorbed failure before condemning him to a life in prison without parole. Daniel is currently in prison in Wisconsin's Waupon Correctional Institution. Daniel Bartelt has never taken any responsibility for the murder of Jesse, nor has he expressed regret for his actions. More than eight years later, the Blodgetts are still waiting for Daniel to disclose the truth about what happened, even though Buck Blodgett has forgiven him. Buck, believing that this is what Jesse would have wanted, has turned his sorrow into a crusade to end violence against women. He founded the Love is Greater Than Hate project and visited more than a hundred schools, sharing the tale of his daughter's terrible death to inspire students to prioritize love about hate and to end violence against women. Do you think Daniel's problem was rooted in his childhood? Do you think there were signs that Jesse ignored that could have saved her? Let us hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.